Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Dana Andrews in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a story based on fact as we examine a city in terror of its life. A dramatic report which we call the one-man crime wave. Our star, Mr. Dana Andrews. Well, Hap, how are they going? Uh, what, Harlow? Why, your New Year's resolutions. Oh, they're going fine. In fact, they're all gone, except one. Uh, what's that, Hap? Never to use any battery except an Autolite stay full. Well, you couldn't keep a better resolution, Hap, because the Autolite stay full is the famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. There's no better way to start the new year and to start your car than with the battery that gives fast, sure starts every time. And that means the auto lights stay full. And what about its long, long life, Harlow? Why, everybody knows about that, Hap. Fiberglass retaining mats protect the power of every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give that auto light stay full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So, friends, see your auto light battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries. And make sure your next battery is an auto light stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed The One Man Crime Wave, starring Mr. Dana Andrews, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. These murders occurred in a city, a good sized city. If it's your city, you'll know it. Take murder and take carefully into consideration the results of the crime. Tragedy, not perhaps so much for the victim, because to the dead there's no further use for tears. Tragedy, though, for those who are left to mourn. And fear if it happened to your next-door neighbor, the friendly man or woman, the ones with kids, the ones with a big hello and a comfortable approach to living. The fear because it was next door and might have been you. It began on a Tuesday night, senseless, frightful. It happened in a city, and the city began to live in fear for what was to follow. Sergeant Faring? Yeah? I'm Driscoll. I was told to report to you for duty. Oh, sure. You're the new man. Yes, sir. Okay. Come on, there's been a killing over on East Bay. Woman in the street, stabbed. We got to East Bay. The body was still there, shrouded in an overcoat. One hand uncovered lay in the gutter. Thin stream of water washing through the stiffening fingers. She'd been murdered a half a block from her house. A neighbor told what she knew, standing white-faced, frightened under the streetlight. It was 8.30 p.m. and the temperature was 39 degrees. Well, I, I saw her pass my window. She waved. And she had a letter in her hand. I, I guess she was going to mail it at the corner. Did you see her after that? No. I only heard heard a scream. I ran out and looked up and down the street. I, I thought there'd been an accident, maybe, but I, I didn't see a car or anything until I, I saw her lying here. Was there anybody on the street? I, I don't know. I, I thought I saw somebody go around the corner at the end of the block, running. I, I'm not sure. Hmm. You'd better go inside, Mrs. Mead. It's kind of chilly out here. What'll her husband do? He gets off work at 10. What's he going to do when he finds out? And those, those nice kids. What are they going to do? The camera work was finished. An ambulance took the dead mother away, and the search for a murderer was begun. I roughed out the first report, and Driscoll filled in the details. They were not released to the press. The husband of the deceased was questioned. His replies were all negative. No known enemies. His wife was not involved with another man. His own movements on the night were checked and found to be as described. Neighbors were questioned. They had seen nothing of the attack. There were 14 knife wounds in the deceased's body, any five of which could have caused death. The coroner's report is attached. We're proceeding now with the theory that the department is dealing with an unknown assailant, probably with a criminally insane background. The 
killer, if he were criminally insane, would strike again. He did. It was on Thursday. There had been a light snowfall during the day, and as evening came, the temperature dropped lower, leaving a thin covering of crystals on the ground. It was 10 p.m. The street, Washington. A woman of 37 was returning to her apartment. She was a waitress at the Gold Rush restaurant. She was between two lampposts in semi-light when the man stepped out from the doorway. He didn't give her a chance. She was alive when they got her to the hospital. She was alive when I went into the white room to question her. She told me what she could remember, weakly, frightened of what had happened and of what was going to happen. Do you think you're strong enough to tell me a couple of things, miss? I'll try. Can you describe him? Well, he was about your height. Maybe a little shorter. Kind of heavy set. His eyebrows grew across the middle. Funny eyes. What complexion? Dark, I guess. Dark. Any scars? I didn't see. Can you remember how he was dressed? I don't know. I was scared. There was an overcoat. I don't remember. And he had a hat. Kind of a regular hat. All right. You said you told him a man was coming down the street. Yeah. I thought I'd scare him. He'd turn around. I could run. That's when he... Yeah. Is there anything else you can remember about this fellow? No. Hey, hold my hand, will you? Sure. Thanks. Try to remember something now. What color was the overcoat? I told you. I don't know. It was maybe dark gray or brown. I was scared. I was... That's all right. It might come to you later. Just one more thing. Miss? Miss? She turned her head aside. The eyes were closed. I held her hand, and it was the last knowing thing in her life as she died. Quietly, unprotesting. I went back to the office and called in Driscoll. We had coffee sent up and drank it steaming. I'm going to give it out to the papers. This guy's a nut. He'll keep on killing until we catch him. It's best to warn the women about walking alone at night. Yes, sir. What about the description? Well, it's enough for a start. We'll contact institutions, go over our files. We can get to work on that now. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, by the way, did they get any footprints in the snow? No. By the time I got there, 50 people had trampled it all up. For the time being, anyway, we'll have to go on luck, unless we come up with something. That's the trouble with killings like this. City this size, you have a tough time finding a murderer unless he's got a record or a motive. Well, he's nuts. That's his motive, I guess. We'll have to wait for the record. The story broke in the papers on the next day, Friday. The results were immediate and expected. My telephone began to ring and kept on ringing. Crackpots, people who had seen a man they thought answered the general description of the murderer. They'd seen him in a dozen different places at the same time. And they knew more about him than we did, because we had nothing to go on. You've got a lot of patience, Sergeant. I don't know how you take it. Well, I look at it this way. There's always one call that's the real thing. Can't afford to take any chances. This guy's done two killings on opposite sides of the city. That makes it even worse. He's not killing in a pattern. And he might do it again somewhere else. Until we get a lead, I'll listen to anybody who's got something to say. Get me a pack of cigarettes out of my coat, will you, Disco? Yes, sir. Homicide, Sergeant Faring. Yes, ma'am. That's right, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, I'm in charge. The weekend passed, and it was Monday, Tuesday. We worked hard, sifting rumor, possibility. There was nothing much to show for it. The tension in the city mounted, started to build into panic. There was talk of vigilantes, college day stuff. Complaints as to the ineptness of the police force piled up. We took it and waited. Then the thing we were scared of happened. 
Wednesday morning, a little after midnight, on the west side, a young couple, both of them, ripped to pieces, dead before any help could come. And early the next morning... Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I know, but we may have got hold of something. The young fellow struggled with him. He ripped off a button and some cloth from his coat. Yes, sir, the lab's working on it now. Yes, sir, I will. Yes, sir. Well, that was the chief. We'd better be getting something fast. Lots of pressure. Maybe we have, sir. 14th Precinct picked up a man last night. He might answer the description. Kind of crazy. Won't deny or admit anything. Oh? They're bringing him down now. He should be here in about 15 minutes. There's another thing. Have they got the overcoat? No. He wasn't wearing one. And he won't say what happened to it. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Dana Andrews in The One Man Crime Wave. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, what about your New Year's resolutions? Well, Hap, I've resolved to tell everyone the great news for 54. And what is it, Harlow? Why, Hap, an Autolite stay-full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Well, that's reason enough for going to Autolite in 54. Well, if it isn't, Hap, this is. The Autolite stay-full has a life that's longer than your winter underwear. Fiberglass retaining mats surround every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give the Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So see your Autolite battery dealer. That's right, friends. He's a battery expert, and he'll tell you all about that dynamic and dependable Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Dana Andrews in Elliot Lewis's production of The One Man Crime Wave, a true report well calculated to keep you in suspense. The man was brought into my office on Thursday morning. His name was Frederick Sorensen. He'd been picked up ten blocks from the scene of the crime two hours after it had been committed. He appeared to be drunk, and although the temperature was in the low 30s, he wore no overcoat. In general, his features answered the vague description given by the dead waitress. He sat with his head lowered, sullen, ignoring the coffee by his side. Well, you're not under arrest, Mr. Sorensen. This is just a routine questioning. Uh, it's, it's like the Germans or the Russians. Man's walking along, and he's arrested just like that. If you'll answer a few questions, sir, you can be on your way. Well, what am I supposed to have done? What? Can you tell me where you were this morning, a little after midnight? Uh, in a bar, I guess. I don't remember. Any particular bar? Well, there were two or three. I got problems. I, I was drunk last night. Will you try to remember the names of the bars? I don't know. Oh, the Star, I guess, uh, over on Manchester... Well, once in a while I go into the Aster. I, I, I guess I did last night. I was pretty drunk. You've got no right to arrest me. You're not under arrest, Mr. Sorensen. What happened to your overcoat? I don't know. I had it on when I left my apartment. I took it off from one of the bars and forgot it. I, I was pretty drunk. Will you describe your coat? Yeah, sure. It was... Uh... Gray, tweed, I guess, not too heavy. I don't like a heavy coat. It makes my back ache. Now, we'll see if we can get it back for you, Mr. Sorensen. You said you were in the Star and the Aster. Any other place? I don't think so. Oh, oh wait a minute. May, maybe the joint over on uh, uh, Williams Street, opposite the big hotel, you know, the... the McDonald's Bar and Grill? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I think so. I don't know. I'm not sure. Hey, look, I'm answering all these questions. What am I supposed to have done? Two people were killed just after midnight last night, a few blocks from where you were picked up. 
It's our job to investigate anybody who might know something about it. I don't know anything. When the officers questioned you, you refused to answer. They asked you if you knew about the murders, and you said, uh... I'm not saying yes, and I'm not saying no. I'm not saying anything. Do you remember that, Mr. Sorensen? No. I was drunk. Did you ever get drunk and try to remember what you said? I didn't even know what they were talking about. I, I didn't kill anybody. I got enough problems without killing somebody. All right, Mr. Sorensen. I'd like you to wait in there for a while until we check on some of these things. Have you had any breakfast? No. We'll have some set up. Hey, listen, if I'm not under arrest, how come I got to stay here? As a good citizen, Mr. Sorensen, I'm sure you want to help in every way to catch the murderer. Sure, but I don't... You're helping, then, by staying in there until I get back. We checked. The Astor, Star, McDonough's Bar and Grill asked questions. Sorensen was known to them all. In particular, he was known to Mr. McDonough. Yeah, he was in here kind of late. Had a good load on. Could you say what time? Oh, one, maybe two. Tell you, Sergeant, it was a big night last night. Maybe the cold and snow, but everybody felt good, didn't want to go out. You know how it is. Oh, sure. Did you happen to notice whether Mr. Sorensen was wearing an overcoat? Mm, I couldn't swear, but put it this way. If he wasn't, I would have noticed because it was too cold outside to be without one. Now, wouldn't you say the odds are he was wearing one? Possible. Freddy, there's a couple of butts under the table at the end. You missed them. You didn't find an overcoat after you closed? Gray? Tweed? No. Uh, Freddy, you find an overcoat a man left here last night? I guess you're out of luck. Yeah. Well, if it does show up, Mr. McDonough, I'd be obliged if you'd give me a call. You bet. Say, uh, it's uh, none of my business, but have you arrested Sorensen? No, routine questions, that's all. Uh, well, I wondered. He's not the type for that killer. I've talked to him. He's been coming in here for five or six years. He's a nice guy, quiet, no trouble. As a student of human nature, I'd say he wasn't your man. Thanks a lot for your trouble. We checked some more. Sorensen's apartment, neighbors, found nothing. The man was quiet, but well-liked. The overcoat had disappeared. And since his alibi held up, we didn't have much choice. You've been cooperative, Mr. Sorensen. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, that's okay. Hey, did you find my overcoat? I'm afraid not, but if we do, we'll let you know. I sure hate to lose it. Uh, uh, it's all right for me to go now? Yeah, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. All oh, right, that's okay. Hope you get that guy. We will, Mr. Sorensen. Yeah. Well, so long. Nice to have met you. Thanks again. Yes, Sergeant? He's leaving now, Driscoll. Get a man to follow him and a relief for that man. I don't want Sorensen out of sight for a minute. Yes, sir. Right away. <laughs> They followed him for a week, and the only thing he did to be noted was to buy a new overcoat. I summed up our progress for the chief, and it wasn't much. Thanks. Uh, well, sir, he's a suspect, but he's a weak one. We've checked pretty carefully. He works for a lumber yard. He's been there nine years. No financial problems. He was married, but he got a divorce three years ago. His ex-wife says he was all right, kind of moody sometimes but no big thing. Just wanted to live alone. Didn't want to be married, so she gave him a divorce. There wasn't another woman, as far as she knew. So, unless that overcoat shows up somewhere, and there's a button with some cloth missing, we haven't got much. And for another week, no killings, no progress. We continued to have the suspect followed, but for no other reason than the physical description given by the dead waitress, but even that was flimsy. On a Friday at 9.15 p.m., it was raining, not cold enough to freeze, just a bitter, penetrating wetness. And that's when the overcoat showed up. The overcoat with the missing button. There was a man in it, too. He'd been picked up in a bar, disturbing the peace. His name was Winters, and he had a record. Five arrests, three convictions. 
It took a couple of minutes to match up the shred of cloth and button to the coat. And we had our first break. We sent for Winters. It doesn't have to be Sorensen's coat, Sergeant. Doesn't have to be, no. You think it is? That's what we've been working on. Come in, Winters. Sit down. Okay. Now, you ever see this coat before? Sure, it's mine. You swear to that? Sure, I swear. What were you picked up for? Bum rap. Fella starts picking on me in a bar. I hit him first. He was bigger than me. Disturbing the peace. How would you like murder added to that? Murder? You're crazy. I didn't kill nobody. Where did you get the coat? It's mine. What do you mean? Where did I get it? Two weeks ago, that was Wednesday, 16 days ago, a man and a woman were stabbed to death. The murderer wore this coat. We've got a bit of cloth and a button to prove it. Your coat, Winters. Listen. I never killed. Now listen. Just because I got a coat that looks like... Oh, I, I didn't. Where did you get the coat? I told you. I... This is Driscoll. Yeah? Where? Oh. What about Torrance? You sure? Okay. I'll tell the sergeant. Stabbing off Lincoln Avenue. Woman. She's dead. Sounds the same. All right, Winters. You hear me now. If you want that to be your coat, I'll accept it. No more talk, and you're up for murder, and I'm not kidding. But I don't think you did it, and I'm giving you one more chance to tell me where you got it. Well, look, Mr. I... Okay, I found it. Found it where? In a bar. When? Like you said, a couple of weeks ago. What bar? I don't... Come on, come on. Astor, the star, McDonald's? McDonald's. Okay. Did you see the fellow you got it from? Oh, look. Now, I'm a loser. You're going to get me in on a larceny and rap? You want murder? I, uh... Yeah, I saw him. Was he wearing the coat when he came in? Yeah. He he acted kind of strange. Like he was hot, maybe drunk. He sat down at the table, took off the coat. Then he started to look at his hands. For a long time. I remember because he looked kind of nuts. Then he went to the men's and left his coat. Uh, it was a good-looking coat, so I... Did you hear him call by name? Well, a couple of guys seem to know him, I guess. I don't remember what they call him. Can you identify him? I guess so. Okay. I'm holding you as a material witness. You gonna book me for taking the coat? I'll think about it. With the new killing, we had another problem. The man on duty outside Sorensen's apartment had reported that Sorensen hadn't left the place all evening. That might mean we had still one more killer working with the knife. But Driscoll and I drove over to Sorensen's place. We had enough to pick him up. Matson was on duty, and he came up to the apartment with us. We had to break the door down. Sorensen wasn't answering. And when we got inside, we knew why. Sergeant, I swear he didn't come out. That's where he went out. Fire escape. Leads out the back. I'm sorry, Sergeant. He never... Can't do anything about it now. We go after him, Sergeant? No. Put out a call to pick him up. We'll stay here. I think he'll come back. Matson. Get back out front. If you see him, don't make any move unless you're sure you can get him. Yes, sir. We turned out the lights, left the window open, and waited. The rain kept falling, and it got cold in the room. An hour went by. We didn't smoke for fear Sorensen would smell it as he came out the fire escape to his window. So we just waited. Sergeant? Yeah. Would they execute a man like that? I don't know. They might as well. He'll cost the taxpayer a lot of money for the rest of his life if they don't. He'd be better off dead. For himself, he'd be better off. What makes him do it? You read about it? You see him, talk to him? What makes him that way? Don't ask me. I'm just a guy who has to try and catch him after they've got their kicks carving out somebody's life. <sighs> Boy, I'd sure like a cigarette. Who's there? 
You're under arrest, Sorensen. Disco, come on. He'd sensed something wrong, and he wasn't close enough for us to get him. We followed him out to the fire escape and up to the roof. It was raw up there, and a slick was forming underfoot. There was only one place for him to be, behind the elevator housing shaft. He could only approach it on one side, so I stationed Driscoll behind me to cut him off if he made a run for it. Come out with your hands up. I, I haven't done anything. Let me alone. I feel sick. Why don't you let me alone? Get out here where I can see you. Move slowly and keep your hands high. I want to die. I want to die. Come on. You don't know. You just don't know. You don't care. Well, I won't... I won't go to jail. You're not going to kill me? Listen, what the... You... You all right, Sergeant? Yeah. They got my arm. Thornton? Thornton. He's done. Better call the ambulance. Suspense. Brought to you by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Dana Andrew. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, boats, and industry. These products include bumpers, die castings, industrial thermometers, and batteries such as the famous Autolite Stay Full, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor types, Voltage regulators, wire and battery cable, Autolite bullseye seal beam units, and Autolite original service parts for all Autolite-equipped electrical systems. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week... The story of a man who was able single-handedly to rob a bank of $50,000 and get away with it. It's called The Face is Familiar. Our star, Mr. Jack Benny. That's next week on Suspense. The One Man Crime Wave was written by Anthony Ellis. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. In tonight's story, Joseph Kearns was heard as Sorensen and Lee Millar as Driscoll. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Charlotte Lawrence, Junius Matthews, and Tom Tully. Dana Andrews can soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Duel in the Jungle. And remember next week, Mr. Jack Benny in The Face is Familiar. Buy Autolite Stay Full Batteries, Autolite Original Service Parts, and Autolite Standard or Resistor Type Spark Plugs at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. If you know a man in the service, one of the greatest favors you can do is to write him regularly. Even though it is often difficult for servicemen to reply promptly, word from home is a great morale builder. Resolve now to write and keep writing to a serviceman you know. This is the CBS Radio Network.